Hey, Single Plan Academy Gold members. I got some great stuff for you today regarding ball position, foot position, and radius. And this is stuff that's basically exclusive for you because I wouldn't be discussing this stuff with people that weren't really into it because there's some detail here that I want you to understand that it, it seems complicated, but there's a reason for it. And it's, there's biomechanical reasons for it. But let's talk about why we're seeing the foot position, ball position, and the club face square relative to your target line and how all this really works. And by the way, I had this question for Mo as well. I mean, I, I used to ask him, your club is behind the ball, but is it square? And he'd say, yeah, it's dead square. Well, some of you are trying to put it back, I would say artificially maybe, put it behind the ball. In other words, don't just set the club behind the ball, it's gonna be open. The proper tilt of the body, so watch, when I put the club and I tilt correctly, I can get the face square from the tilt of the body. It's not just putting the club back. See, there's a difference. So when I, when I look down here and I have the seven iron and, it, it's, uh, and I tilt it back, I can have it square and behind the ball and have all my dynamics of the club face correct. The other thing too is when I'm looking down here, I am squaring up this part of the face, not this part. And so many times you see people see it from this angle. They see it from that camera angle. They're seeing the top part of the club. I want you to see the leading edge, the scoring lines, the blade, that, that's actually the, the direction of this face. So tilt it back and look at the bottom lines on the club, not the top edge of the club face. And that should be pretty square to your target line. And that's a square club face. Um, a little bit of the difference between a uh, single plane full swing setup and a single plane short game setup, okay? This is the same thing Mo did. It's the same thing that we preach and teach at all our schools and our instruction. I just feel my arms are just hanging. Just like it will look, they're not, they're not right. put, just look, look, just, just hanging, a little, a little tight here. That keeps my stroke smooth. Uh-huh. So hanging more below your shoulders and not straight up. Oh, yeah. straight out. Yeah. Like the way you walk. Mm-hmm. Like, just like the way you walk. The way she goes. So again. What I've done here, and I'm going to show you both examples of this. I'm going to step in a full swing. I'm in a full swing. That line will fit me perfect. Okay. Now, I go to a short game shot. So let's go to a little bit of a chip. And I'll put a ball here for you guys. If I go to a short game shot, I'm choking down in the club to get a little more club head control. I'm getting a little closer to the golf ball. Now, if I put my hands up in that same position, that toe is stuck into the ground. That heel is off the ground. So if I hit a shot right now, it's going to toe dig, and for most people, it'll go to the right, or it'll actually stop the shot. So what you want to do is when you get in a short game shot and we choke down in the club, you also have to drop the hands. Now, that butt end still pointing to that lead side. It's not quite the pivot point because we dropped the hands a little bit, but it is pointing to the lead side, but I'm making up for that effective line angle. So now, dropping the hands, that club is flat on the ground. Now I can hit a chip right down the line. If you choke down in the club, which we definitely promote, even Mo did this in his short game. If you choke down the club, you've got to make up for what we call the effective line angle. You drop the hands to get that club sitting on the ground flat. Okay, if that club sits on the ground flat, now when we make impact, the middle of the club is going to be hit on the ground, which is how the club is built, which will give you good ball flight, good line, good consistency again. So make sure next time you go out, next time you're practicing or playing, maybe in a full swing a little bit. If you got a little full swing, maybe you're punching one underneath a tree or maybe you're hitting one into the wind and you're choking down the club a little bit. Anytime you choke down the club, you got to drop your hands a little bit to make up for the effective line angle so we hit the middle of the club. Hitting the middle of that club, making sure the middle of the club's cutting through the ground will give you a lot more accuracy, a lot more consistency, and make this game a whole lot more fun. My mission to understand Moe's golf swing was based on a passion to bridge the gap between Moe's feelings and the mechanical and scientific reality. Moe described his swing effectively when he said, I swing like a pendulum, I swing under myself, and I have less moving parts. Like a pendulum, the fixed point at the top doesn't move. Mo's head didn't move as the trail shoulder moves up into the backswing and down into the downswing, making it easier and more consistent to swing from address to impact. One of the keys to simplicity in Mo Norman's golf swing was the position of the spine from address to impact, where the model has a 20 degree spine tilt to start with. What this did, it created the feeling that Mo called like a pendulum. When you look at the model and you see the shoulder position, because the spine is tilted, it's putting the shoulder back and towards the plane. 
Now, when he goes to the top of the backswing, the shoulder moves up, and then when he moves down, it comes straight back down into impact, making an up and down motion of the shoulder. Notice in the backswing again how the head is staying in position as the model goes back and the shoulder comes down in an up and down motion just like a pendulum. Now he also felt like he swung underneath his body. He said, I swing underneath myself. Well, because of the pre-turn of the shoulder, because of the spine tilt, this shoulder here feels underneath as opposed to being around. So once again, in the backswing moving up and then moving down, felt very much like an up and down motion as opposed to an around motion. So you had four things going on with Mo's swing. He felt like it was a pendulum moving up and down. The swing had less moving parts because you had less movement of the spine and the shoulders. And you have the swing going inside to inside as well as he feeling, I swing underneath my body. And that's what you're gonna feel with a single plane swing. Mo also said to me after we finished the round, he said, uh, gotta play golf from the heart. Gotta play golf from the heart. And I always thought about, you know, what does that really mean to play golf from the heart? And why was that kind of his parting message for me? You know, why was that? It wasn't like go win tournaments or uh, go shoot 61, you know? It was more about this kind of idea that golf is a game that gives you more than just shoot a score. So. I think that was an important message, and I think that was why Mo was telling me something at the very end of his days and, and the last time I was going to get to see him, that, that there was more to golf than just playing the game. Uh, it was You're getting something out of it, and it's doing something for you emotionally and spiritually. That's, and that's what I took from it. And so there was this restaurant. I don't remember the names of the restaurant, but there was a inside, next to the hotel where we stayed, the Radisson Hotel, across the street, there was three restaurants. There was a steakhouse upstairs. There was a kind of a bar and grill. And then downstairs was an Italian restaurant. And so we were all, all, all of us were debating. I was with Larry and Mo and Gus Maui and Audrey Maui. We were all debating, you know, where should we eat? Should we eat in the steakhouse, the Italian, whatever? And so we all decided that we wanted to eat in the steakhouse. But when we walked in the restaurant, Mo was sitting in the chair. Mo was kind of sitting kind of by himself. And he's holding a stack of papers. He had four or five of these pieces of papers. And on the paper was the play golf from the heart, written on the piece of paper, play golf from the heart. And when I walk in and saw him, he handed me a paper and he goes, here you go, play golf from the heart. And he had, he had a bunch of them he was handing out to all of us. You know, kind of wanted to make sure we had a copy of this. And uh, so we're deciding where to eat. And we decide we want to go to the steakhouse. And Mo says, Mo says no, no, I want to go eat at the Italian place downstairs. And we're like, OK, whatever, whatever Mo wants. So we go downstairs to eat at the Italian restaurant. And as we go down there, Mo orders a steak. <laughs> and I, sometimes I think Mo just challenged you all the time. He had this little way of challenging you, you know, the way you're thinking. Um, but yeah, he handed out the play golf from the heart paper, and we talked about it at, at dinner, you know. And he's, he's like, you got to play golf from the heart. You got, you got to, it's the reason you play. And I think Mo was teaching me a lesson. Live in the moment. Play golf from the heart. Live your life from the heart. And... You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, wasn't it great getting to know Mo and spend time with Mo? But you had to listen to Mo. I mean, it wasn't just about golf. I mean, it wasn't just about, hey, he helped you with your swing, which to me, that's the reason I approached him in the first place. I wanted to be a better golfer, but a better person. I mean, Mo intuitively understood this stuff. He intuitively knew this stuff. And I think that's what golf did for him. Golf was a spiritual experience for him. It was definitely, it's definitely a spiritual experience for me. I know that when I'm on the course and I'm playing, there's probably no, nothing more fun than that for me. I think that's a big part of what he was sharing. And, and I saw a lot of that uh, in my conversations with him in the last, at least last year. I, I know there's a story where a friend of mine told me that before Mo passed away, he was giving away all his golf clubs. You know, he was giving away all his equipment. He was giving everything away. And... Um, in a sense, it's like, hey, I'm giving gifts of my knowledge and my, these are the clubs I use and this is why I did this. And he's sharing his experiences of life and this is part of his sharing. And I think, I think if you can give the people the knowledge that he had, I mean, just think about the knowledge that he, that he had at that time in his life. And, and all of a sudden he's realizing that, hey, the real gift here is more of like live your life in every moment, play golf from the heart. Mo used to always recite a poem called Golf is Happiness. It's a great poem. Matter of fact, we should listen to Mo actually 
tell the poem because Mo, Mo has it memorized, right? So he, so I used to listen to Mo tell me this poem all the time, and in the poem it talks about what golf is really giving to us. It also is talking about how it builds character and, and how, and that's what I'm talking about is we can the game gives us a lot. Um, it's a it's a lesson for life, and that's what this poem is really all about. If people only knew what happiness was, what is happiness? Happiness is achievement. What's the father of achievement? Motivation. What's the mother? Encouragement. A fine golf swing is truly achievement. Man may lie, cheat, and steal for gain. But you'll never gain the golf swing. To gain the golf swing, man must work. It's work without toil. It's intoxication without the hangover. It's stimulation without the pills. It's defeating, yet it generates courage. It is humbling, yet it ennobles the human spirit. It is dignity, yet it rejects annoyance. Its price is high, yet its rewards are richer. Some say it's a boy's pastime, yet it builds men. It's a buffer for the stresses of today's living. It cleanses the mind, rejuvenates the body. There's these things and many more, for those of us who know it and love it, golf is truly happiness. And boy, don't ever forget it. In this section of Short Game by Design, I want to talk about when Mo said every putt to him felt like a three-foot putt. Okay, and in fact, it's kind of interesting. Probably when Mo was a younger player, younger golfer, a lot of people, and I know this, a lot of people said that he wasn't a good putter. I'm not sure that you can go shoot 59 and not be a good putter. Maybe just hit that close and eh, who knows. But I mean, even Ben Hogan was considered a poor putter. But as Mo got older, he became a very good putter. In fact, I spent some time with Mo when he was older. We're talking in his 60s and so on, his late 60s, and he was actually a very good putter. And I remember him saying every putt to him felt like a three-foot putt. And I'm gonna explain what that means. I'm actually gonna give you a drill here. You can do that and practice that. Get a couple golf balls. I'm gonna take a Sharpie and I'm gonna mark on the green. I'm gonna mark the spot where we start. I'm gonna put a little dot. Okay, and you're not gonna hurt the green with this. This will go away, and I'm gonna also mark a spot right below the string, okay, in between those two T's. So now, I'm gonna do the same drill. But instead of having the two T's, I'm gonna pull them, and I'm gonna focus on that black dot. So I'm gonna set up, I'm gonna focus on the black dot, and I'm gonna put down the string. That one right over the black dot, right down the line. So I'm going to do that again. So now my focus is starting in the position with the mirror, setting up in a good position. Now, putt down over the black dot. Okay? So that's step number three. I'm now focused on the meter spot, just like Mo said. Every putt's a three-foot putt. Now we'll go to the last step. And the last step is I'm going to pull the string, okay? And I'm going to pull the mirror. So now what I've done is I've got two black dots. I'm gonna put this one on this dot, so now I'm simulating like I'm on the golf course, okay? So now, and even if I wanna get up and line up the putt, I can get back over it, I can line it up. I know this dot is on my line, just like Mo said, the three foot putt, I'm trying to make that putt. I'm gonna take a practice stroke or two for distance. I'm gonna sit up over it and try to hit my intermediate spot, and that was perfect. I'll do it one more time for you. So I set up on this black dot, okay? I know the line of the putt, I've already hit some with the string. I'm gonna focus on my intermediate spot. I'm gonna set up, I'm gonna look down. I can still see that spot off my peripheral vision. I'm gonna hit that spot and work on a three-foot putt. Guys, whether you're hitting long putts, leg putts, short putts, two, you know, four footers, five footers, 20 footers, 30 footers. A lot of golfers use an intermediate spot. They'll get behind it, they'll line it up, and they may look at a, you know, a different colored piece of grass, maybe a little piece of sand. They may look at you know, a little mark in the ground, whatever it is. They'll look at something that's ahead of the golf ball and try to roll over that. And that's what Mo was describing. He said, every putt to him feels like a three foot putt. He's just trying to hit that spot and then to continue it for however long he needs to make the putt. But this is a great way to do it. So notice, I started with the mirror and a string, okay? And then I put a gate up. Then I went from putting two Sharpie marks with those two T's. And then I pulled everything and just used the first mark and the second mark and the Sharpie mark on the green, set up over them just like it would in the golf course. I have an intermediate spot. All I'm trying to do right now is roll across that intermediate spot with good speed. And that was perfect.